In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. You know, after that string of seven comedy stories, I got to get myself serious here real quick. But we do have a pretty serious matter on this because I think that sometimes we just need to get back to the basics in our spiritual lives and sort of refocus and recenter. This is a really great story. And it talks about Mary and some of the other women going to Jesus' tomb after, of course, he's been crucified. And they're doing what Jewish women of their time would have done with a newly deceased. They bring spices and and herbs and things to try to keep the body from decaying in a a way that would be too quickly. And and what they would do is they would wait for the body to decay, and then they'd move the bones into the the, the side of the tomb or whatever. I'm not going to get into all the details, but essentially... They're doing something that helps preserve the body to make the burial process a little easier. And so that's why they arrive at Jesus' tomb early, not that morning, because the Sabbath would have been the morning after Jesus is laid in the tomb. They're not allowed to do work on the Sabbath day, so they wait until the next morning, Sunday morning, to go. And that is, of course, when they find the tomb empty and angels standing guard at the tomb. And I I want to bring your attention to the verses after that where the angels are giving an explanation for what has happened. And this comes from Luke 24, verses 5 through 7. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. The part of that verse that I really want to focus in on is where the angel asks, why are you seeking the living among the dead? Because I think that there are broader implications of that, because, of course, that was a direct question, and a good one, at the women in that situation at that time. But I think it's one that is pertinent and applies to us today. Because I think that we have a habit of seeking the living amongst the dead. How often do we do this? And I'm talking about it in a general sense. How often are we seeking heavenly things in earthly places, and then we're somewhat surprised when we don't find them there. There are places that we know we should not go, whether it's physical places, places in our mind. I know one that affects my generation quite a bit, places on the internet that we know we're not supposed to go there. We know that we shouldn't be there. There's an old Bible song from, or Bible school song, I should say, sorry that little kids learn. Grandmother taught this one to me when I was probably two or three. It's, uh, be careful little hands what you do, be careful little feet where you go, be careful little mouth what you say. It's not an uncommon thing for Christians to go to places where we should have enough common sense to know we're going into a place of the dead. We are walking into a place filled with corruption and evil and dead people. Now, sometimes that's not always necessarily a bad thing because sometimes you have to go where the sinners are, and I get that. But if we're going into a place where we know we're going to be tempted and we're, we're putting ourselves in bad situations that we do not need to be in, and we're lying to ourselves about being able to stay spiritually strong and be able to do that, how often do we seek the living amongst the dead? How often do we seek people in Christ, good Christian people, amongst the dead? I I remember a story of a a friend of mine that he had kind of fallen away from the faith, and one of the things that kind of helped wake him up, because he, he got really into alcohol, 
and it was, he, he went into a, he had done a lot of drinking like privately around people that he knew, but he decided that he wanted something to drink and there was nobody around to drink with him. So he goes to a bar and he sat down in the bar and he struck up a conversation with a couple of the guys there. And he just, because it had been his reflex his entire life, he asked, uh, one of the guys sitting there is like, so where do you go to church? Just trying to make small talk. And the guy looks at him kind of funny and, and kind of confused and says, we, we don't really go to church. It wasn't just that he didn't go to church. It was that it struck him as odd that somebody would even ask in a bar where you go to church. Now, granted, I'm not saying that you know, anybody that sets foot in a bar is automatically doomed to hell or anything like that. That's not the point of the story. That's not what I'm getting at. What I'm saying is this was a guy that was seeking life in a dead place. He was seeking after godly things. He assumed that there were going to be devout, devoted Christians in a place where everybody there was confused as to why he even thought that was going to be a possibility. And how often do we do that? ignore our better instincts and go into a place where we know we shouldn't be. And then we act surprised that people react to us in such a way like, no, that's, you know, that, that God thing's not really our thing. We do it with social media. We do it all the time. And I think that we need to be more aware of our surroundings in that. But getting more specific to this story, how often do we seek Jesus in a dead place? Because we're looking for God, and that's what Jesus was, God in the flesh. How often do we look for a Savior in things that are not Jesus, and we know that we're not supposed to be looking there? Whatever it is that we turn to, whatever our pet sin is, you know, we're, we're lonely and unfulfilled, so we start seeking out things that we shouldn't be seeking out. You know, maybe you're having troubles with your, your kids or your wife and you start talking to some woman at work or some woman you met at the gym or, you know, reverse the, the gender there. Some woman doing that with, with a man that she met. We start looking for things that are not God to replace God in our life. And if our conscience has been trained correctly, all of a sudden, we're going to hear in the back of our head, yeah, yeah, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? I know countless times I have done this to myself. That I have, and I'm sure that all of you have too, started seeking out some kind of fulfillment, some type of purpose in my life, and I had the answer the whole time. But because I got focused on something that I didn't have or got focused on something bad that was going on in my life, I started to ignore that and started looking for fulfillment in places that were not God. It doesn't work. You are looking for life in a grave. And the sooner you realize that, the sooner you're going to realize Jesus is the God of life. He's somewhere else. And if I want to be alive, and if I want to have a fulfilling life, i got to be somewhere other than here. Because the last place I need to be looking for someone who's alive is in a grave. And what's the answer to that? Because I'm going to tell you right now, if your God is the political realm, and politics is probably pretty important to you if you listen to my program. But politics is not my God. Who wins the next election is not going to affect my spirituality. When it comes to entertainment, I, I like movies. I like video games. They're not my God. And sometimes I have to remind myself of that. But whether or not I never see a movie or play a video game again in my life, in the grand scheme of things, really doesn't matter all that much. Any number of things can be our God. But I'll tell you one thing. Jesus is not in the realm of politics, and he is not in the entertainment world. 
And there's a whole bunch of other places that he isn't either. He's not at the bottom of a bottle. He's not in the, the end of a syringe. He's not in some kind of self-help book. If you want to know Jesus, he's in the Bible. And see, that's the solution that is given here by the angel. Now, he's not chastising them because they are actually seeking Jesus, and that's a step in the right direction. But you'll notice what he says there. Is He says, do you remember how we spoke to you in Galilee? Like He's saying, this shouldn't be a surprise to y'all. Jesus told you what was going to happen. And he was pretty emphatic about it. And then the reaction to them is that they remembered these words. You see, this was the issue. We've heard the words of Jesus too, if you're somebody that has studied the Bible. But either we weren't paying attention, or we used to have this message down and we forgot and we let the the cares of the world come into our life. And so, what is the step really that we need to do to find Jesus, to go to that living place and to remember how to find him? It's pretty simple. We do exactly what Mary and, and the other people gathered there should have done. Hear the word, hear the words that Jesus told them in Galilee, believe in it, and then act upon it. Because they had to believe that Jesus was going to rise from the dead, and they also had to act upon it. They had to take that information and use it to seek him in a different place. See, if they'd done that from the beginning, they wouldn't have wasted their time coming to that empty tomb. They would have known that Jesus was up walking around somewhere because he said he was going to rise after three days. And so if we want to be people that aren't looking for Jesus in a grave, looking for Jesus in a dead place, looking for something other than God to replace God, that's really as simple as it is. Hear, believe, and then act upon it. In other words, obey and do what Jesus asks us to do. If we do that, we will find life. Because Jesus is the life. Stay the course, friends. You know, you really should like this video and subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel. Oh, what's that? You want to know what's on the channel before you subscribe to it? Oh, no, 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 it's like Obamacare. So you gotta subscribe to find out what's on it.